Hi, everyone. Welcome. Good morning. Are we all wide awake? <laughs> Have a little more coffee because we need to be, we need to perk up. Uh, my name is Katie Couric, uh, for those of you who don't know me, and I'm with uh, Yahoo News. And we may be headquartered in the United States, but our work is seen in 60 countries, and we're streaming live today on many of our international homepages, which we're very excited about. So panelists, no pressure, <laughs> but you definitely need to be awake this morning. Uh, today we're talking about ending poverty through parity. In other words, why gender equality is good for everyone and how we can all get there. In a whole sea of game-changing initiatives, Melinda Gates has learned firsthand that helping girls and women can solve many of the world's problems. Along with her husband, she's made a bold new bet on the future that involves improving the lives of those girls faster in the next 15 years than ever before. Uh, just 21% of all members of parliament are women, but it is much higher in Rwanda, and President Paul Kagame will tell us why. There are just 13 women who hold their nation's highest government positions. One of them is Norway's Prime Minister, Erna Solberg. Mm -hmm. We're happy to have her here as well. As Executive Director of UN Women, Fumzila Mlamba Nuka, and I'm so happy that I just have to need to call her Fumzila <laughs> from here on out, has the enormous <laughs> task of looking at the big picture and taking concrete steps to make that picture look better and brighter for women all around the world. She says we're all at a critical crossroads right now when it comes to gender equality, and we'll talk about why. And finally, a recent survey found that women hold less than a quarter of senior management positions in companies around the world. Unilever leaves those statistics in the dust. More than 40% of their management is female, and CEO Paul Pullman wants that number to be even higher. So please welcome our panelists this morning. So, Kumzila, I'm going to start with you. In 2000, the UN member nations adopted a set of eight goals, including cutting extreme poverty in half, stopping the spread of HIV AIDS, and providing universal primary education. The deadline is now this year, 2015. You have said that we are at a crossroads, as I mentioned. Why? Well, uh, we are at a crossroads. Uh because uh, in the implementation of the Millennium Development Goals, we've gathered a lot of evidence about what works. We know that girls' education is important, that it's a game changer. We know that uh, enabling girls to have access to reproductive health services and re respecting their reproductive uh, rights is also important to reduce early pregnancies and therefore to give girls a chance to fulfill their potential. So on a number of uh, aspects that we have implemented, we know the answers, uh, but we have not used all the knowledge that we have to make a difference. And many of the countries that actually need to embrace and to adopt vigorously uh, what we know are not doing that. So, and that is a question of leadership. So at a crossroads because we know what we know, we know that it makes difference. And if we just tip the other way around and fully embrace and drive and implement, we can bring about far-reaching changes, not just for women and girls, but for society. And what are some of the biggest challenges you're facing when it comes to, you know, you know what works. Many of these countries know what works, but they're being resistant. What are, what are the challenges in, in actually implementing these goals? Well. There is a question of resources. I think it's true there are countries that, that struggle with resources. There is also a, a, a intense gender stereotypes in many of the countries uh, that weigh heavily against uh, women and girls. And also bef because in many societies, women are not in leadership uh, positions, they are unable to implement what they believe will work for their countries. So the exclusion of women in decision making works against countries and works against uh, girls, but also it works against society as a whole. We're going to be ex further exploring both of those mm -hmm. um, issues. But, but first, Melinda, in the same year, 2000, you 
and your husband, Bill, started the, the Gates Foundation. Why has gender equality become such a, an important, a key part of your mission? Well, because I, I've been have this huge privilege to travel in the developing world a lot, all over the world, but in the developing world, I'm out at minimum three or four times a year. And, and you just see it. I mean, you see the central role that a woman plays in society. And so, uh, you know, it's like if you invest in a girl or in woman, you're investing in everybody else because she's the center of the family so often. And so she's the tutor, the nurse, the doctor, the communicator, the family member. And yet, if we don't do that, you don't unlock the potential of what's, what you can do for a whole family or community or society. So we know that a woman, for every marginal dollar she gets in her hand, she plows 90% of it back into her family. And women will tell you all over the world, I'm the one that's in charge of feeding the kids. If there's a health shock in the family, I get an episode of malaria with a child, I have to have the household resources to pay for that. So we know it's fundamentally important to make sure her health is, is there, make sure she has a voice in decision-making in the family, and make sure she gets an education. Because if, if, she, if a girl gets an education and becomes a woman, her child is 50% more likely to make it to their fifth birthday. And if she's educated, she's twice as likely to educate her daughter. So the estimate in the next 15 years is that if we could get parity in the labor force uh, in Africa of women, you'd raise the GDP of these economies by 12%. You'd raise India's GDP by 10%. You see President Abe talking about how do we get more women in the workforce in Japan. It just makes sense. So by contrast, what do men spend their money on? <laughs> people will tell I'm you a little afraid things. to ask. Yeah, but. Some people will say whiskey or beer. Um, it, it just, it's, it's the focus on the family. And it's not all men. Believe me, I'm, I, I have great men in my life. I know many, many great men. We need men who are part of this conversation of lifting women up. But they just tend to spend it on different things than the, than the woman does if it's in her hands. And she'll often tell you that she doesn't want to have to go back and renegotiate with her husband either. Once, she, once they've determined the household finances for a year, don't make it harder on me to have to go redo that negotiation if we run out in a hunger season or we run out because there are two episodes of malaria in our family, not one. Prime Minister Salberg, I know that you agree. I mean, everyone I think on this panel agrees that when you educate a girl, you change the world. And it really does have a ripple effect. And you've witnessed that firsthand as well. Yeah, but can I just state one thing first? Because I'm a politician and I think we always make, we always make sort of an argument for why we should invest in women. Uh, about all the triple effects and all of this. I think it's very easy. It's just, it's fair. It's a human right. Exactly. I, mean, I mean, to me, it's more provocative that, that we are not doing it than that we are doing it, because we should have uh, a society where you invest the same in boys and girls. But what we see is that we don't do that in a lot of communities. I agree, but yeah. don't you think you oftentimes need economic reason as well uh, to to really pursue these kinds of goals. It would be great if everyone said, this is fair, but mm. oftentimes there has to be another reason for them to get motivated to do this. Yes, but we shouldn't stop saying that it's fair because if it, everything is an economic argument and nothing is value-based, then we are gonna get difficulties with a lot of other things when we are, we are discussing it. The human rights, mm. the basis should be in the, in the bottom of this. Then of course, giving education to girls, I think, uh, Linda said it, She's, it it's, uh, it's about uh, the fact that a girl that gets educated can take control of her own life. She can earn more money. Uh, she can uh, uh, give more education to her children. She get more control over her own body because she knows more about the body. She knows more about her maternal health. She can take care of, she can use contraceptives. I mean, she, taking control of your own life is probably the basic start to make development for you and your own family. And that's, that's what education does to girls. We know that they get better wages if they get to primary education. There's a bigger effect for girls than boys of a secondary education when it comes to wages around the world. So educating that is good for the girl, the lady themselves, but it also triples down to the children. So if you want to have uh, better nut nutrition of children, if you want to have um, children that um, also will go to school, the best, best uh, thing to do is to invest in their mother's education while she's young. 
then you will get generational effects in a society. And in fact, you know, I don't want to be a Debbie Downer here. While some of the millennial goals have not been reached, some there's some good news. Progress is being made all around the world, and that often gets ignored, doesn't it? Absolutely. So we've cut the number of deaths by half of children dying under the age of five since 1990. The world has cut those deaths in half. And so when you think about what that means, and Bill and I are predicting that that can be cut in half yet again in the next 15 years. So what it's taken us 25 years to do can happen in the next 15 because we know the tools to use and we're rolling them out, vaccines, malarial bed nets. President Kagame's country, Rwanda, has had the steepest decline in childhood mortality in the last five years that we've seen in the history of the world because of his leadership and what he's done and the way he set up his health system and rolled out vaccines and tackled these issues. So these things that we're talking about, whether it's women and girls, whether it's, whether it's um, children dying, whether it's maternal health, they are absolutely possible. And I agree with you that it's interesting. You go to all these forums and we have to make the economic argument for women and girls. Are you kidding me? It just, it all, I mean, I do that because I know how to do it, but it just makes sense. It is a fundamental human right. Why not unlock the rest of society? Mm -hmm. we're, we're living in 2015 for Pete's sake, so we should just do it. It makes complete sense for all kinds of reasons. Do you find that the, the conversation is, is changing and shifting? You know, I, of course, in Beijing, Hillary Clinton talked about this, these not being women's issues, but human rights mm -hmm. issues. And do you, do you sense that, she also complained, though, as Secretary of State, she'd often talk about these issues, and, and various heads of states, their eyes would kind of glaze over. Do you find mm -hmm. that people are embracing this as, as a human rights issue rather than a, than a women's, uh, something that women only should care about or that really is focused on women, Paul? No, absolutely. We, we, one of the values, and you find it in many companies, is respect for the individual. I don't think you can create a uh, performing or a high-performing organization if, not, if everybody doesn't have the chance to, ri to rise to its full potential. And in many organizations, we don't achieve these targets because women say we're up against these ceilings or I don't get the same opportunities. So we spent a disproportionate amount of time on and effort on programs, obviously, to help, be it, uh, uh, you know, maternity leave programs are very important to us, mentoring programs are very important to us, uh, flexible work programs are very important to us. I think we have more tools available than, uh, than you can think of to create an environment for people to be successful. The economic argument is actually time lost to spend time on that, because anybody that uh, just has a, a, a decent set of brains can figure out that it's better to hire out, out of 100% of the population than only 50% or to have that diversity that comes in. For us, it run, actually runs uh, quite uh, much deeper than this. We've put a business model out there which we call the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan, which really tries to grow and decouple that growth from environmental impact and really significantly improve the social impact. That's why we come off panels on the sustainable development goals and what they might be, or the climate negotiations. That we're, that's why we're participating in UN Women. All of our products, actually, that we sell are development products. Uh, we, we are heavily involved in, with our bar soaps in helping a child reach the age of five, simply with sanitation, uh, maternal health, uh, uh, nutrition, stunting. And, and any of these programs that we work with, you come, always come back to women, actually, more so than men that you have to invest in to get your returns. So I think, um, I think in terms of our whole value chain uh, and anything we touch in terms of putting a gender lens on there, and that's very refreshing, not only for the returns on our investments, if you want to talk that way, but it's also actually for liberating everybody to pay their potential. And if your purpose is that high, then the gender balance, and I deliberately say gender balance, I don't say women or men, this gender balance thing actually will come automatically. It's interesting if you think about just this week, and I reflect on this week and still need some more time to do this, but then the things we've been involved in, Jan Pamsilio is here doing UN Women, Helen Clark, we just saw Christiana Figueres on the climate change, Amina on the SDGs. Um, you have uh, you know, others that uh, uh, I forgot now, but, but all of them are women. And it's not surprising that most of these humanitarian efforts that are being worked in the world, which are the essence of our model as well, our business model, are actually run by women. And if you think about why that is the case, is because <laughs> they're driven with a deeper level of purpose. They have a little bit of a longer-term uh, view 
Uh, they're probably a little better in partnership than we are, and un unashamedly, we have to acknowledge that. So if we get that into our total system in Unilever, I know we will be successful for the longer term. But more importantly, I also know that we will be successful in solving these issues for which we exist in the first place. President Kagame, um, I know Rwanda was decimated after a horrific war and genocide back in the 90s. And, and this terrible legacy actually paved the way for women to take a greater role in so many aspects of R Rwandan society. Can you explain that evolution? Yeah. Well, to start it off, let me, I mean, on a lighter note, uh, somebody in the crowd should be asking me how it feels to be on the panel that is balanced in, in the gender, but in the favor of women. So uh, <laughs> I, I feel good. In most, in, good. in most cases, it is uh, in the favor of men. But, uh, and, and, or I have, Isn't this a, a refreshing change of pace? Absolutely. I'm a, I'm a, I was avoiding using male or female dominated, so it's balanced in the favor of uh, the other. It helps to be called Paul. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, but, Right, from the, on the question, first of all, with the problems we had in Rwanda, the tragic situation and, and so on and so forth, when you look at the details of it, more women were actually affected, uh, and children, and you find they were caught up in a mess that uh, was mainly not so much because of women, but because of men. But we, during the process of liberation and then uh, cleaning up the mess uh, after the genocide, the first thing to come to our mind is, was how do we bring everybody in the country to participate, to be part of the change that we want in the country? And that naturally had to bring in women as well. Uh, and here, many people have eloquently said it. It's here an issue of right. It's, you can take it into economics or right or whatever, but it is everything that is right to do. So we thought even in our policies and politics, we simply needed to involve everybody, but we are also aware that women were a disadvantaged group in our society for many years for different reasons. We didn't have to let it remain as such. We, we thought one of our missions we had to bring change to our country was also to actually deal with that particular problem, as well as benefit from it, because 52% of our population is women. Now, we had to be thinking of a problem that involves everybody and that should address everybody's problem. And then you want to keep out the 52%. Doesn't make sense. So this is how we proceeded in putting policies in place that were intended to actually... And that, that included quotas. Sorry? That included quotas for your country. Yes, in some cases. For example, in the parliament, uh, we must have heard this, we have 64% composition of our parliament is women. Now, this comes about in, 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 in two ways, a number of efforts, actually. While the quotas work, say, on the side of government, on the side of government, the Constitution tells us that, say, we shouldn't have a government of ministers that does not have at least 30% of women in that government. On that side, it is easier because government and cabinet ministers are appointed. However, it is not the same when it comes to parliament, where members of parliament are to be elected. But still, it helps. From the beginning, we have mobilized the population and the different political parties to this point of making sure that women are significantly represented in, at every level. So we start with that 30%, but the 30% in the parliament where, where the members are elected, it's due to mobilization. We mobilize women to say, put yourself there to be elected. And then 
we have had more than 30%, which we initially had said we wanted to cover and went beyond up to 64%. So it is not entirely just quotas. It's, it's making sure that people are aware and mobilize pe mobilizing people to make sure that they consider this point, but also encouraging w women to be there themselves and make sure that they actually participate. And, 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 and Prime Minister uh, Salberg, I, I know that many young women and women mm -hmm. in your country actually the, the notion of quotas is really mm -hmm. anathema to them. Yeah, we don't have quotas into, uh, into the parliament, but some of the political parties have. Uh, but, uh, there, and then we have quotas on, on all types of committees that is established, scrutinies and all of that that, that is not directly elected. They have to be at least 40% of, of each uh, gender. And there is a 50% or well, there's a balance in the cabinet, uh, same number of men and women. We have a women prime minister and a women's finance minister. So we say, well, if you look at the powers, it, women have more power. <laughs> Don't tell the other ministers I said this. Um, it's, um, but but there, is a, there is a reaction. When I meet young people in Norway, young girls, university students, and there are 60% of the universities now that are women, um, they don't want to be quoted. They say that I want to be elected as me, with my qualifications, mm -hmm. based on my merit, I don't want anybody to say she was elected because she was a woman. Mm -hmm. And that is a balance you have to find in a way. Maybe we have moved so far that it's more, much more natural to have women in all types of position, that now there will be a reaction that is just sex that decided, not your individual competences. Because sometimes I think you will find men who get not elected to somebody saying, oh, that was because I'm a man. Uh, maybe it was because the girl was better than him, but it's easier to say it's uh, because we are not representing uh, the sex. Yeah. But it's, it's a challenge. I'm an old-fashioned feminist. I think, you be, I, think you as a, I think you as a politician also represents a bit your gender because there are different issues in politics between men and, and women. But I think you, you should also listen to the young voices that say that we want to be in a situation where we are your own merits, your own talent, your own achievements that should, um, should be the focus. But, uh, by the way, we're taking... It's a context. Go ahead. It's a, it's a Norwegian context. The playing field is relatively leveled. Mm -hmm. There are many countries where the girls and women have their back against the wall so much that without special measures, it's actually impo impossible just to foot, put the foot in the door. Ideally, uh, everybody should make it on their own merit. And I'm sure many countries will reach where Norwegian has reached. But uh, there are countries where it is absolutely, absolutely difficult. But it's wonderful that you, women in Norway are able to take full advantage mm -hmm. of their context and their situation. But I don't think this is something that you could deal with as a one size fit all. Well, how do you feel about quotas in general? Do you think they're necessary in countries they're necessary. that are not as progressive? Well, for instance, the fact that uh, uh, we have so underperformed on representation of women in politics, I mean, look, Rwanda just sticks out. We are only at 22% of women representation in parliaments, and it's taken us 20 years to actually just move by 10%. And at the rate at which we are going, it's going to take us 50 years to reach gender parity. Come on. Mm -hmm. a, a child born during divorce 2015 will be 50 before there's gender parity in the world. Will be 80 until there's gender parity in, in, in the economy. Without extra measures, without the kinds of things that Paul is doing in his company, can we just imagine how slow that will be? I think I look at the people in this room. I'm sure we all don't want the space. So there's got to be something that we could do that is extraordinary to push forward. I really want to agree that it is an issue of context and, and what we can do at any one given time. Let's look at this issue of quotas, like we practice in, in the ordinary life of social economic development. For example, on safety net issue that we create, when we are trying to, say, bring people out of poverty, there are certain specific programs that are put there to try and accelerate people out of poverty. While you could easily have said, okay, let people struggle. We are putting there everything. Let people struggle until they make it themselves. So it's just a principle of how, how do you, and it doesn't take away 
anybody's dignity or uh, the fact that they want really to make it themselves. You have to bear that in mind. But at the same, same time, we also know it's like if you, a man locked somebody in the room and he has that responsibility and said, OK, let somebody struggle until they open the door and get out. No, this man sometimes has a responsibility to go and open the door and let the person free to go where they want to go. So it's in the same process that for sure in our society, there was this huge gap. And we, are, we, we, we want to see acceleration of making sure that a difference is made in that short time. So that's why we apply certain measures, and it is very contextual. Huh? No, I agree with Svantila that you need to do something extraordinary. But, but if you look at it, there are actually more women graduating from universities now in nearly all disciplines than men. And, and frankly, if you would recruit on scores or capabilities, which mm -hmm. a lot of companies do, they'd actually also score higher. And I think mm -hmm. there's enough data around that. So, but what we're talking here about is for companies, and, and yet we're not making progress. So I understand this challenge on quotas, but we actually don't have quotas in the company. Um, I, what we need to do, even as leaders of this company, need to ensure that these systems work even if we are gone and others come in, mm. and that they become a normal part. So you have to work the values and behaviors. Mm. So we, obviously, we like to, mid-career recruiting, we like to do that 55% instead of 50-50, or entry, that we have a little bit of a buffer or move a little bit faster. But we really spend far more time on asking people why not, and have people uh, explain why not and make that very transparent. So if you would have um, a position open and, and we have people apply or you look for who is, who is available, we say, why isn't there a diversity candidate? And um, why are your numbers at 30% whilst in other departments we are at 60%? And it can't always be HR and legal. So. Um, we what make often, the trans what, what often do you hear the an what answers? No, there are there are answers that that um, <laughs> what we are trying to do. Obviously, sometimes people need help. There are there are time lags. There are there are histories. There are, uh, but but if they would be behaviors, for example, or biasness, uh, we work very hard to get them out of the system. We bring that in our training and development. If we then ultimately see that people still are not able to do this, then these people will not be successful and usually end up outside of a company like ours. But if you don't work that behavior, now, the time pressure comes in here because some people are being forced also by the external environment to move fast. And actually, women don't appreciate that. The majority of women, certainly in our company, but also if I go out there and talk to them. So we have found out that uh, we've moved about 10 percentage points up in the last four years. But all these 10 percentage points were winners for the company, that I can tell you. They were better mm. people in better jobs. And they've has made the system so much stronger, including the business results ultimately, that it then gets in there. So that the moment that I move on or whoever takes after me don't have to worry about this. And it doesn't become a program of the week or a program of it's the month. self perpetuating Or getting a price of the year. It's, it's really has to be part of your business model and you have to firmly believe that. So it then boils down to leadership, in all honesty. Mm -hmm. I, once in my former careers, I was given uh, extra reward for uh, diversity progress. And I refused that mm. because, and it's not to be a hero here, but I refused that because I said, instead of giving money to people that do something that you need to do anyway, why don't you start a system where you start to punish people that don't do it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And but this is absolutely what is needed. Mm. And if that is how you change behavior. And that's, mm. that's a good idea. And Fumzila, you know, you, you talk about um, how, how frustrating, uh, clearly you're frustrated with the, the pace of change in many mm. countries. Is it, a, is it a leadership vacuum? Are there cultural obstacles that are so deeply ingrained that even if these programs and opportunities are available, mm -hmm. there's still a lot of pressure from all sides not to take advantage of them? Mm -hmm. what, what is keeping people from embracing these kinds of changes? Well, leadership is a big part of it. Again, let's use uh, Rwanda, not because you are here president. But in 20 years, so much can happen in a country because of leadership. Uh, the culture in, in Rwanda is not different from the culture of other African countries. Uh, people are conservative. Uh, there is pushback on, so on some of these issues. But people take the cue from the leader. If you, you send the right message and you are consistent, 
people actually do change. So the issue of leadership is absolutely, absolutely important. The same thing I can say about implementing legislation that has to do with violence against women. In countries where you have progress in addressing uh, uh, ending violence against women and ensuring that perpetrators are brought to book, it is because someone in, in leadership makes sure that the system works and implements and, and follows up. Where people, where things fall between the cracks, you have good legislation, but it does not uh, get uh, implemented. But also when it comes into stereotypes, one thing that we have uh, is that uh, you are, we are born into a situation that has so, such deep prejudices. Patriarchy is bestowed on men at birth. Whether you want it or not, you have a privilege as a man, and you either fight against it and reject this patriarchy by becoming a feminist man, or you enjoy the privileges that come with it. And right now, we're recruiting those who must fight against patriarchy. If it was class, we'd be saying that they must commit class suicide. So we're asking them to actually take the active step to call for a, a gender parity a, in terms of pay, uh, to ensure that uh, uh, there's uh, equal representation, et cetera, et cetera. And that means that they displace themselves from these privileges that are otherwise given to them at birth just because they are a man. And that's a tall order, isn't it? I mean, do you uh, find... That, uh, I mean, for the guys sitting here, not such a big deal, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. but, for some, but for some of the, some of the boys and men I'm you're dealing with... I'm talking to them with, nicely. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, Emma Watson uh, delivered, a, I thought, a very mm. compelling mm. speech at the UN, and then she was here yesterday. But the message to boys was, gender equality is your issue, too. Mm. And a man named Dan Moore, by the way, we've asked for tweets with the hashtag gender gap. Anybody, if you're too shy to ask questions at the end, feel free to tweet us a question. But a man named Dan Moore asked, what specifically can men do to help bring women out of poverty worldwide? I mean, obviously we're talking about sort of men in, in general, but uh, Melinda, why don't you answer Dan's question, then tell us more microcosmically what you're doing in terms of kind of having a, t uh, a, a top-down approach when it comes to dealing with many of these patriarchal societies that you've been, been trying to educate? Well, I think if you have a, a discussion, um, first of all, about what's important, some of these issues come out with men because particularly in, you know, in, in anywhere that you go, whether it's the developed world or the developing world, men have a mother, a sister, a daughter quite often. And when you contextualize it and you say, you know, mm. don't you want your daughter to live a better life? When I, when I travel in the developing world and you ask people what their aspirations are, almost every single parent talks about wanting a better life for their children. And that if they can get them on that path of health and food and then education, it can be a better life. And so I think you have to start with that context. And then I think all the, the gender work, much like Paul talks about making an ethos and a value of his company, once it starts to become that, you, it grows and it stops becoming this side issue. I think one of the things we are a bit doing ourselves a disservice of when we talk about gender is having women and girls stuff be a side issue. Mm -hmm. No, it has to be mainstreamed in your work. And that's what we're doing mm -hmm. inside our foundation's work. And so a, a particular example is seven out of 10 adults in Africa are farmers. And so they farm uh, plots of land that are about two hectares and they need to get more income off of their farm. And particularly as the climate is changing for them, they're seeing more drought, they're seeing rains come at different times. When they come, they, they're torrential, so they get more of a flood. Mm. So we were saying in our agriculture program, okay, we wanna get this seed system working and we wanna make sure we teach people to plant properly and use fertilizer and get access to market. Well, if you just assume gender parity is already there, you assume when you get the seeds out in the seed system, the new drought-resistant seeds that exist, for instance, for corn, that everybody's gonna get them, male and female far farmers. There are a huge number of female farmers in the developing world. Well, that's just not true. Unless you look at the gender issue and say, I'm gonna specifically make sure that women have access to seeds also, the reason it doesn't happen is that the agro dealers, that is the extension workers who go out and, t and spread the seeds, teach about planting, teach about fertilizer, they're men and they tend to reach the men. And so what you have to do is make sure that those agro dealers start to reach women, pull women into their mm -hmm. groups, get the tribal leaders involved. Because again, if a woman can get that extra income in her hands, she will plow it back into her family. 
And, and so much so that we have to even look at unintended consequences. Women will tell you that if we make it too hard for them, that is the, the crop only goes to their husband, they're actually not gonna plant that crop because again, they might have to have that negotiation with their husband yet again if it becomes a crash crop. So they'll actually intentionally just sell things that they can sell at their farm gate because it's easier. One of the last things I'll just say is a way to unlock this for women also is to get cell phones in their hand because if they have a cell phone, they can get the crop price at market. And so if they put their crop at market with a middleman who takes it on a donkey or a bicycle or a motorcycle and he sells it for $10 a bushel and tells her he only got five, she gets taken. But if she knows the crop price at market, she knows it's both worth it to send it to the middleman and she knows that she's getting a fair price. And in fact, so you gotta put it into the program. Only 40% of the world is has internet connection. Mm -hmm. and, and Prime Minister Salberg, how important do you think is obviously broadening that number for a whole array of reasons, not only for access to information, for education, but also for banking. I think it's extremely important because that's the new way of connecting and it's a new way of, of um, building new types of businesses, getting information out. I'm very, uh, I work hard on, we, we co-chair the MUD Advocacy Group uh, on, uh, and, and I work hard on, on the issue of education. And I know education is, in a way, formal education, but it's also the informal mm. education. Is what do you as a person need, not to get a certificate, but to in fact improve your own life. The connection you can have with an internet connection, learning more, getting information out, is extremely important. That's why we are also exploring and inviting, inviting participants in the social media uh, areas to, to, to see can we do more on how we educate through the social media to reach out to young people, grown-ups, who need more information, more education to learn more, uh, to get teachers better trained. Uh, there's an enorm enormous way of moving. Uh, the World Bank, uh, the chief said uh, yesterday in a meeting I had, you can, you can move the best, in, best mathematical teachers all around the world through that type of connection. Mm. Because you can, you can get the most backward African village, mm. if they have an internet connection mm. in their classroom, Absolutely. it could be possible to get mm. the best mathematical teacher to help them improve the teaching of that school. So there's an immense uh, possibility on that, but also on businesses. Uh, I remember I have a friend who works for CARE. She was in Niger 20 years ago, and she made the first Niger uh, women's project on, on, um, on building women's group for, for capitalization and savings. And that's their CARE program today. And she came back and she said, sort of, this, is, this, was, a, this was a good idea, it, it improves. Think of how this really now functions when you can use a mobile phone and how much larger network, the Grameen Bank, for example, how, how this uh, financing system changes totally. Uh, you can all offer money for investments uh, for small. I have this, uh, all of these NGOs that now run the possibility that you as a person can give $25 to invest in a new cow in Azerbaijan, which I have done which is, I think, is to give a girl, give a partly sponsor a lady for a loan. I mean, you can get this new type of financial system that is not through governments, but through civil society, where you as an individual, and I've enforced this on all the, all the young people in my family who get Christmas presents, they always get this investment present too, because I think it's, it's a great way of, of telling that the day they get these expensive new presents, they should also have some social conscience to it. So this, we are, we are connecting. You, could, you can now follow up on a loan somewhere in the third world if you're a school child in Norway, and it gives you the feeling that you understand more, it gives you the possibility, and it gives women possibility to get that little extra money that means that you can enlarge your shop, have crops that you can sell, and, and you are seen and there's a, there's a possibility to connect which you haven't had before. Gumzila, you know, we have a, a tweet which, you know, I think we're talking about the promise of technology, mm -hmm. but then that often stands in stark contrast with the realities on the ground. Someone asked about what are we doing to encourage girls' education considering the way terrorists are attacking them. Yeah. And of course you have a whole different situation 
in Nigeria right now, as well as many other countries, including in some cases mm -hmm. Pakistan, Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. So how can you operate in an environment like that where there is such a price to pay for gender mm -hmm. equality? Well, ideally, girls and boys should enjoy being at school and being with their peers. But we have to work with what we have while living in this challenging situation, including the invasion of, uh, of terrorism. And technology is quite critical. As a, a prime minister says, it is affordable in many cases compared to having to provide a full set of teachers for the different subjects that children have to learn. You can maintain a creditable quality education for learners in different parts of the world. It's the biggest way to have access to education. And in fact, with the use of technology, we can reach universal access to secondary school within a generation. Because one of the blockages we have about universal access to secondary education and primary education is access to quality and trained teachers. If we are able to get the best maths teacher in the world and he is in Brazil, that teacher can teach children in Guapa in South Africa. And giving exactly the same quality of education that you can give to a child who is living in Cambridge. So we do need ministers of education. We need a, a heads of state to embrace the dynamism of technology so that we can push it as far as we can. Where we can save girls from working in dangerous places, from being exposed to dangers of terrorism, uh, by learning in safer places and at home, as long as they have a device. I think it's important to do that. But that does not mean that we must not fight terrorism because mm -hmm. we do need a free world where girls and women can go to wherever we can. But in the meantime, and also for the long term, we must harness technology much better than we currently do. Do you see that happening? Do any of you all see this sort of confluence of leadership, technology, Absolutely. and real world changes on the ground? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. 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 We, we, we've seen that technology has brought many possibilities in education, in health, which are key to women, as well as safety on other grounds. For example, we have a program uh, now which Melinda supports as well in, in, in Rwanda, where we have partnered with the Nike Foundation, created something called Girl Hub, and this is targeting adolescent girls focusing on their education, on their health, so that at least they grow into their lives uh, as better citizens. And we have seen this work and technology cuts across, and people have access uh, to different parts of the country in places where otherwise it was very difficult mm -hmm. to reach with the messages. In area of uh, health, people sending uh, what the problem is in their health and to the centers where there is the medical facility and getting feedback and without having to travel there or, or, and back. So it, it, it's very practical. It's, it makes a big difference. Obviously, you, oh, sorry, Melinda. I was just to say, on the cell phone, we're seeing just amazing things happen. I mean, a woman know, and a girl knowing where the tap is now open in her slum, where fresh water is actually coming through because it comes through at irregular mm -hmm. times of the day. Uh, the village savings and loans, being able now to hook up to the banks. I mean, there's a, a system now that's at scale. 90% of households have mobile money now in Kenya, 46% in Tanzania. Bangladesh has mobile money. Philippines has mobile money. And what it means is if you're out in a remote rural area, if your spouse goes into the city to work, they can send money back to you. Also means you can save a dollar a day, $2 a day. So when the school fees come due as a family, you have them. The most ingenious thing I saw a group of women doing at one of these village savings and loan out in Tanzania, normally they have their lockbox with their three padlocks. You have one, I have one, you have one with their keys. They couldn't all each afford a mobile phone, but they wanted to make sure they could save their money instead of the lockbox of the phone. They got one phone amongst their group of 30, and you got two codes of the pin, I got two codes of the pin, and you got two codes of the pin. A new kind of sharing economy. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so they not only save, but eventually when that Tanzanian system gets hooked up, they'll be able to get insurance, a line of credit, where mm. they not only didn't want to spend the bus fees to go into the city before, men and women were unwelcome from the rural areas in the banks. Another thing I've seen in a slum with mobile phones is that women will give out, it's called Circle of Six, 
They'll give six people that they trust their phone number, so, and they have a one button push. These are women who now have a smartphone, say in India and Islam. The one button push, if there's an act of violence, they push that button and they know six people know about it immediately. One in three women say they have they come up against an act of violence in the world. So cell phones are gonna change things. It's not the only thing. We have lots of other things to do. But boy, cell phones is one of those innovations that's gonna unlock so many things in health, farming, banking, information that'll change, really will change things for people all over the world. Yeah, for sure. J just yeah, in informal education that Prime Minister was talking about, we are involved in UN Women uh, uh, with the quite uh, ambitious uh, project to reach out to men and boys uh, because to fighting the stereotype, we've normal, we normally would fight, we'd educate and, and, and reach out to girls and we've left boys uh, behind a lot. So the empowerment of boys so that they can also embrace gender equality is actually quite urgent. And we are using technology in this campaign called He For She. And of course, uh, both Paul and, and President Kagame are big supporters uh, and, and, act, and are champions uh, in that. But we actually are using technology. Just the week that we launched He For She last September, within two weeks, there were a billion people that were having a conversation about issue of feminism and men. I mean, where else would you get that kind of outreach? Were you surprised by that reaction? Yes, I was. I, I, re I mean, even though I'm sort of a, a techno frenzy type person, even that for me was actually quite exciting. And then yesterday, we were revamping the campaign involving private sector in which Paul participated, leaders of state in which uh, uh, the president participated as well as encouraging boys in universities. Again, by the end of yesterday, my social media people told me that there were actually about a billion conversations that were happening. So there's something about this video. If I can just get a billion good men <laughs> to stand up. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? And, 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 and Paul, Paul and Erna, I, I just wanted to ask you all because, you know, it's one thing to have a lot of women in leadership positions, but what concrete things have been accomplished because those women are in those positions. What actual impact have you seen it have in terms of initiatives, laws, or any kind of policies, Paul, that might be in your company? Oh, there is no doubt, and, and I just want to build on this and get to your question, because um, we've made a commitment to empower 5 million uh, additional women in our value chain, and uh, half of that will be smallholder farmers. Technology would mm. never otherwise happen. In India, we have 100,000 women, which we call Shakti women, which means strengths, doing distribution in the little villages, still very rural. The technology saves them. What I'm most excited about, actually, was in the technology next to all the things that are being said, is that it, I think that it gives women a voice mm. that can be aggregated to be heard. Mm. And that is far more powerful, and I hope we're seeing that soon. So the He For She campaign, which, by the way, is invented by women at UN Women, <laughs> is helping men make a commitment. That's the first thing. And I would really encourage all the men to sign up because before you run a marathon, you have to register. <laughs> and um, so also the case here. And then you hold your mirror up and, and you say, do I really live it? And because you signed up and even people like ourselves fail sometimes and you become a little better every day. So I think that progress, process you need to go through. Then there are wonderful programs at the UN. Uh, we have the uh, uh, business and uh, human rights principles that actually get to, because it's about rights, then it's about skills, and then it's about opportunities, is for women more important than anything else. You, you have the UN uh, Women Empowerment Principles, mm. the Girl Declaration. Mm. Uh, so there are wonderful programs that are actually driven by women that we can adopt as men, if you are still in charge of your companies to really empower uh, your organizations. And then the most important thing I come back on that is, is to live it in all you do. Just apply this gender balance. It's not a women's lens, it's a gender balance lens. I, it's just a simple example, we have tea plantations. Um, I like tea because the smallholder farmer can make competitively a living. And we cannot, Africa's population is going to double. Seven out of 10 already now are in agriculture. If we don't create jobs in agriculture with the smallholder farmers, we're not going to solve the global employment problem. We're talking sometimes in these parts of the world, problems that are minuscule versus what is happening in these emerging markets. So we have to empower women. All of a sudden, you need to think about lighting at the tea plantations or safety. You have to think about your education that you provide, your health care. You have to think about facilities that are different. More importantly, you have to think about these laws in these countries. Are they really helping you? 
And the uh, sexual harassment is a big issue. If these women go to the police, it's a big issue. So we have programs to educate the police. How, do, how far do you want to go as a company? When you make these commitments, you are really getting it into the DNA of all you do. Now, interestingly, these programs uh, are mainly driven by women because they better connect with the women that you're trying to lift up in the first place. But they would not succeed if the men around them don't create the environment to accept that. Because it's very easy, whatever you put in, to destroy with behavior. You, you understand? Yes. And that is what we're trying to drive. And, and again, it's hard work and it cannot be fixed overnight. But I think that's the, the best thing. And then anything we do with our brands, our brands are basically there uh, I would say, and I don't want to be because I'm on the panel, but they're 80 percent there to serve women, actually. Mm. We, Dove is a very uh, successful brand for us. It's a very successful brand, not because of the product and what it tries to solve. It tries to solve women's self-esteem. It's hitting 300 million women now already and you, at their uh, 12 to 14 year age, where they, 4 percent of the women only feel comfortable in the bodies they're in don't even want to participate in public activities like swimming or other things because they feel uncomfortable. These programs help them. No wonder that a brand like Dove is very successful. All of our hand washing programs we do, six million children don't make it past the age of five. You can cut that down by 40, 50% just by hand washing. It's the cheapest solution. We happen to sell soap. That's why it was invented in the first place. <laughs> right. uh, you know, so uh, focusing on, again, focusing on women because the habit chains with women and then bringing it home, and actually girls again, and bringing it home, is the best way to get that adoption. So most of the things we do, our food programs, is all about nutrition. It's not just calories, you need the nutrition. Again, focusing on women to do that. So if it's that ingrained into your business models, I think you have a hard time escaping it. Meanwhile, well, Prime Minister, what, t tell us about the maternity leave that you have in mm -hmm. Norway, and was that because were women the driving force behind that policy? Um, maybe I can start by saying that the, the large number of women came into politics in the beginning of 80s. Uh, we had about 40% of our parliament being women since the mid 80s. I think there are, and of course, if you, if you look at the correspondence to that, yes, there's been done some really large changes for women's life after that period. Uh, now we have full coverage of kindergartens. Uh, we have a maternity leave that's uh, a year. Uh, we paid the, uh, at paid? At pay, up to a certain ceiling, which is the same we have for all welfare goods by the state. And then most, most employers and most um, uh, more, uh, and all government and local government uh, will pay 100%. But of course, the, the government subsidy is uh, uh, on the level above the, uh, uh, the pay up to the income of a university trained teacher who has worked 15 years will get full coverage with it uh, on a maternity leave. Uh, so it's, it's most, mostly all women have full. And then of course there's 10 weeks now that is mandatory for men to take. So they're not- We told the prime minister a lot of people are gonna be coming to Norway to have children now. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and this, it, did this come up because there was a lot of women in politics or, became, or, or, or did, there become a lot of women in politics because you needed to do this. Mm. I think it's the, si the last question. What happened was that much more women went into politics because they saw that their needs weren't met, that they had issues that they wanted to solve. And I think it was a cross-party thing because you got it in all the political parties. So then you get more children, uh, to, uh, uh, kindergartens, you get more maternity leave, you get more focus on, on, on how do you solve. I think a critical thing for women's participation, the possibility of being a mother and participate with a full career in the workforce. Mm. Mm. I think that's what the Scandinavian countries have managed to do. Mm. That's why we have such a high par uh, participation of women in the workforce too. That's why so many go to university and use their academic skills afterwards. Because if you look at other European countries, a lot of women get great career, a great <coughs> education, mm. and then they stay at home afterwards mm. because they tend for their family instead. It also means that Norway has one of Europe's highest birth rates. As you know, that's a problem in most European countries that the birth rates are low. 
We are nearly reproducing ourselves. We are reproducing, we are growing because we have immigration too, but we are nearly reproducing ourselves. That's because you can manage to ha have a family and be active mm. in, 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 in the workforce. And I think it's, it's, yes, it's women's leaders in politics, but it's also why a lot of women went into politics, because politics has to correspond with the people's needs. Mm. And not a majority of male didn't see the needs of women at that time, so they were more in. Can I just say one thing about the he for she campaign, or the tweet, what can man do? Mm. If you look at one thing that is common in all of the world's countries, developed and in the development, mm. violence against women yeah. is a large problem. Women's security is a large problem. Sometimes that stops women from participating. Sometimes it hinders them to live a full life. And I think male activity against violence, mm. children and women are crucial. I've been to see men's group in Liberia discussing why we should not rape. Which is, uh, I think, mm. I don't need, I, it's a discussion I wouldn't have heard in Norway, but of course, why should, why should why should we not harass women? Why should not women feel like sexual objects if they move around in a man's world? That's a Western mm. concept that you have to also do. I think men could be more uh, concerned about this, work more on that, because even in Norway, we might have good degrees in all of this. Women still get raped. Women, women still feel harassed. And, and there's still a lot of violence against women. And in fact, President Kagame, you have that issue in your country. While you're doing so well mm. in terms of women in leadership position, mm. uh, violence against women is a real issue for you. Yeah. Well, this is what I wanted to say. First of all, what, we, what men can do, it simply starts with don't be an obstacle to women's well-being. If we start with that, then we go on and make sure that, for example, in the case of, of Rwanda and how women being in the positions of responsibility uh, has helped. We have seen, for example, pieces of registration passed, but of course followed to make sure that uh, things are implemented. For example, in terms of protection of girls and women. In fact, we have uh, a case uh, well, we used to have a police chief who was actually a woman. And at that time, something very nice was put into operation, was structured right from the police, wherever the police has stations, to Minister of Justice structures, to districts, where if any case happened, it would be reported almost real time to the point that with a combination of police and uh, attorneys, they would actually immediately deal with the case and even possibly prosecute in a very short time. Without, so, and we would get feedback from all districts almost in a very short time, whatever cases have happened. And this was also supported by parliament and it has been operation which uh, I'm sure the people dealing with the gender issues uh, seen that. On the other side, we saw women. In the case of Rwanda, there never used to be, women were not allowed to inherit property. So women helped in, in, in parliament to pass a piece of registration that actually allows women to inherit property, and so on and so forth. So the, 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 their presence has, has helped. It's not alone that women could have done this, it's because, first of all, generally, in the government, the thinking is positive like this. But once women are there in decision-making, at decision-making level, it becomes much simpler. So education matters, both of women and men. And we have seen that, of course, where there is violence against women, or anywhere violence generally, people expect that there will be accountability. So mm. through that education, we have seen, you know, what we used to have to see 15 years ago, 20 years ago, or historically, 
come down drastically. Before we wrap things up, I thought I'd give everyone in the audience, or at least not everyone, because we'd be here all day, but <laughs> a few of you an opportunity to ask a question. And if you could, there are mics, I think, here, and if you could just identify yourself. We don't have much time to do audience questions, but let's try to get some of them if we could. Do you want, want to just grab the closest person? Would you just introduce yourself? And first, thank you. Sure, hi. Daniela Belueres, thanks for an excellent panel. Um, this year in September, world leaders will agree on a new set of sustainable development goals, and gender, gender equality is on the table for one of them. And I wondered if the panelists thought we could actually achieve gender equality by 2030 in the economic and political spheres, and a few things on how we might get there. Thanks. No. That's a great question. In fact, that was going to be my wrap-up question, but which is, you know, what are I know they're going to be announced in September, I believe. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, what are they going to be, and are they achievable? And I'd love to hear from each panelist what you would like a goal to be. But go, you go yeah, ahead so and. I can, even so, I, well, I think the goals are achievable as they are currently drafted. Uh, what is good about these goals compared to MDGs is that across all the goals, we've got indicators that focus on women because the women's issues are there in every issue, in education, in health, in the economy. But we also have a gender goal that focuses on women's leadership, on economic participation, including the uh, issue of unpaid care work which affects a lot of women. Just by a stroke of a pen, providing social protection, recognizing, reducing, and redistributing unpaid care work, we could change lives of many women. It also addresses violence against women, something that we did not have in the MDGs, which I think is big, as well as uh, practices, uh, harmful practices to women, such as forced early marriages, female genital mutilation. So all of those things, if we really implement them earnestly, this could be game changers for the life of women because it's got ripple effects. If you take that and the mainstreaming of all the, of, of, uh, the indicators and all the other goals, that's quite a substantive package. Are you optimistic, Paul? Yeah, in the, um, in the um, report that the Secretary General put out, uh, Road to Dignity, um, he had six elements. One of them is people, and he specifically calls out uh, women and children, and that's very important. We do need to have a standalone goal on, on uh, gender, equality and women empowerment, that's also there. And then, as you are saying, in each of the cross-cutting, be it health, be it financial services, be it education, you need to put a women lens in, just what I was talking about, what we're doing in all the things in our company. If we do this and achieve that with realistic targets behind that, we just came out of a, a discussion around that, I think we have a fair chance of getting, uh, getting there. What about you, Prime Minister? Do you believe, are, are you optimistic? Do you believe that some of the goals that we just heard that will be announced mm. are achievable? I think some of the goals are achievable, it, but it will create a lot of effort. Mm. If you think parity, no, we don't reach that in 15 years. Uh, that will take a long time. Uh, that's about economic redistribution. It's a lot of, lot of different issues. But if you look at the different items, yes, we can do more. Do we, for example, abolish all violence against women? No. Not in 15 years, but uh, we can make it a huge difference mm. for a lot of women. If a country like India can stop the rape culture that they are, have moved into, if some of the West African countries are in post-conflict areas and also has that type of rape culture, South Africa has a mm. problem with rape. Mm. It would be an immense progress for the world's women if they could feel the security of walking in the street without an escort and without the possibility of getting raped in some of these countries. We can do a lot in 15 years on that if we want to focus on it, if we want to have civil actions on it, if we want to mobilize grassroots roots. But it will not be a prime minister who tells that you should stop rape, that will stop the rapes. It has to be that it becomes a part of a culture that is so despicable that people f feel that it is so wrong and it's, we are not there yet. President Kagame, what do you think? I think I'm, I'm optimistic. And uh, what is entailed in that report shows, I mean, it's a statement, a statement of uh, what is possibly doable and um, of ambition, of also a sense of urgency. Now, some of the things we may be able to actually achieve uh, in a shorter time than in other cases, 
There are other things we may not achieve, but at least it also remains as a statement that we need to seriously work on it. So we need to continue doing much more of what we need to do, like we have done in the previous case of uh, MDGs, and just continue uh, and try and do more uh, since we have learned lessons along the way and know what is hard to achieve or what is difficult or even impossible and what is also possible and the mistakes that uh, can be corrected. Well, clearly you're an incredible role model and hopefully people will emulate all the things that you've done in Rwanda and are <laughs> continuing to do. So I think you Thank should you. be uh, applauded for that. You can applaud or you don't have to applaud, but um, literally or figuratively. And, and Melinda, you and Bill have set some pretty significant goals mm -hmm. yourself for what you're trying to do with the Gates Foundation. Tell us what those are. And, and I know you're optimistic yeah. because we, we talked uh, early, I guess last week about your annual letter, but tell us the goals that you're hoping to achieve. And, and when you really think about it, if you're, you seriously believe they're doable. The ones that we talk about in our letter, I think, are doable. So we, we basically set out in our letter that we thought we, there's this big bet that we're putting out, which is that the lives of the poor will change more in the next 15 years than they've ever changed in the history of the earth. Because of some of the innovations you heard all of us talking about, because of what people are talking about, investments in women and girls, and education, and in health. So we talk about those in four areas. I won't go into each of them deeply, but we talk about them in health. That is, again, as I said, cutting childhood mortality again uh, by half in the next 15 years, getting maternal mortality down. Our goals uh, mirror what the MDGs have. In health, getting, Af sorry, that's in health. In uh, farming is really Africa being able to feed itself. Some of the things I talked about earlier about seeds and planting and access to market, that Africa being able to feed itself in 15 years would be a huge accomplishment. We talk about breakthroughs in digital banking, and again, getting you know, literally hundreds of millions of people signed up in digital banking that then puts them on the path to not only savings, but loans and credit and insurance. And then the last one we talk about are the digital tools in education that was mentioned earlier. Absolutely, that you know, as the digital tools come along in the developed world and are, you're gonna start to see them opening up in the developing world. And so a child who lives in a remote place can still have access to a phenomenal teacher teaching in Johannesburg or Nairobi or Brazil or the UK or the US, and that is going to transform things. So it's gonna take the digital pieces some time to get out there. We're not saying that all students will have digital tools, but I think when you see the importance of the MDGs, it's what allowed us to make the advances in child health. It's what allowed us to set this blueprint for the world in maternal mortality. Why do we have gender parity now at primary school education for girls and boys around the, the world? Because of the MDGs. We have more work to do on secondary education and other things, but that blueprint for the world shows each of us in our areas where we should all focus and grow and work, whether it's private sector, philanthropy, government, uh, rich world, developing world, et cetera. Well, given the state of the world, I have to say it's incredibly heartening, gratifying, uh, and inspiring to hear so much optimism coming from people who have walked the walk already and who are pledging to continue to do such great work in this area. Thank you all so much for participating. Thank you all for being here, and thank you all for watching. I'm Katie Couric.